All right, so folks, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University Anson Scalia Law School. And I'm thrilled to be here today with the distinguished panel uh, talking about uh, one of the biggest threats facing our nation, uh, that is to say uh, China, the Chinese Communist Party, and its efforts to actively uh, innovate, um, move its economy forward, uh, and challenge the United States' innovation leadership. And we're here today to talk about how the U.S. might think about that challenge, uh, how we might address it both domestically with our allies, um, and what we might do in the trade space as well. So let me introduce uh, my panelists uh, here uh, from right to left. Um, Carl Holschauser. Carl serves as Senior Vice President and Corporate Secretary at TechNet, uh, where he previously served as TechNet's SVP for Operations and Strategic Initiatives. Carl previously served at PwC, Textron, Capital Partners, as well as working in the office of U.S. Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson. His previous leadership roles include serving as Vice Chairman of the Board for the National Cybersecurity Alliance, Chairman of TechNet's Federal Public Policy Committee, and Chairman of the Government Relations Committee of ITIC. Um, so we're ITI, thanks for being here, uh, Carl. He's also an active investor, by the way, in Techstars, which is near and dear to my heart, uh, since I recently became an investor at Paladin Capital. He serves on the board of the Louise Bath Patient Safety Foundation and is a high honors graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, where he was an Archer Fellow. Rob Strayer, what's that? The low bar there. The low bar, <laughs> low bar. Uh, to his immediate left, uh, my former colleague, Rob Strayer. Rob is the Executive Vice President at the Information Technology Industry Council, ITI, where he leads efforts to shape global technology policy, fostering innovation, competition, and economic growth, aligning with government public policy objectives. His role at ITI follows prior role at the State Department, where he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Cyber and International Communications and Information Policy. You were also the acting ambassador, is that right? Or you had an ambassador yeah, yeah. level role, for, correct? Yeah, ambassador yes. level, yep. As well as general counsel for the uh, U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Liza Tobin, immediately to his left, is the Senior Director for Economy at the Special Competitive Studies Project. Prior to SCSP, Liza held the position of China Director on the National Security, at, at the National Security Council, uh, where she led the development of U.S. strategies and policies concerning China, especially in the trade sector. Her new position signifies a transition for handling national security-related issues to focusing on economic research and analysis at SCSP, embodying her long-standing, widely held role, and widely lauded role, uh, as a change agent in the U.S. approach to China. So thanks for being here, Liza, as well. All right, so, folks, we're going to talk about China and tech. So let's just jump right in. Liza, set the scene for us. Give us a sense about the threat that China poses on the technological front, on the geopolitical front, and how we ought to think about that when it comes to U.S. tech policy. Sure. Thank you, Jamil, so much for having all of us today. So, you know, I think it's clear to anyone who's been paying attention to both the CCP's words and to its actions over many years that they're pursuing a long-term strategy to achieve technology dominance and displace the U.S. in this role. So that's not new. That's been uh, really in place for decades. And the only things that I think are somewhat new, and by new I just mean really in the last five or six years, are that the CCP and, and China uh, holistically are achieving, they're starting to make some, some really quite dramatic progress in achieving these objectives. And then Washington has started to wake up. Um, so why did it take us so long to wake up to this challenge? Um, I think there were some guiding assumptions in U.S. perceptions of China. Um, this idea that China only copies and steals and borrows technology and learns from us and that they don't innovate or that they can't innovate. I think that was a reigning assumption for a long time that started to break down maybe around 2016, 2017 or so, and now it's you know basically been obliterated. But you still hear that, that false assumption sometimes. Um, and we really didn't believe that Beijing was serious about what it was saying. Um, and, and now, as we've seen in the last you know, several years, the U.S. government has experienced some unwelcome technology surprises as China started surging ahead of the United States in areas like 5G network hardware, hypersonic missiles, EV batteries, and a number of other areas where they, they've not only caught up, but they've actually surpassed us in technologies that are based on things that often were invented and innovated in the U.S., but then, then China has really gotten ahead of us. Um, so, you know, how have they gotten there? Um, it really has been through a combination of fair and unfair means, or as I like to say, uh, criminality and ingenuity. And I think just uh, seeing it as one or the other really kind of will lead you in the wrong direction in terms of policy prescription. So I like to call it brute force economics, just a way to sum up this 
broad range of tactics, everything from IP theft and market access restrictions, uh, preferential policies for state-owned firms and national champions, um, you know, uh, uh, learning from the West, as well as things like just leveraging China's sheer scope and scale and investing a lot in infrastructure and manufacturing prowess. Over decades, that long-term focus that we've seen has really resulted in world-class manufacturing capabilities. Um, so this, you know, in sum really presents, I think, a unique challenge that the United States has never faced before. Interesting. So, Rob, you know, uh, Liza talks about this sort of uh, criminality and ingenuity nexus. Right? I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, one of the things we've heard a lot about is this issue of IP theft. Liza mentioned it. Uh, we talk about um, market access restrictions. We talk about uh, forced tech transfer. Talk about some of those issues, how they affect U.S. industry, how they affect our competitiveness, and what China's doing in addition to engaging those activities to really sort of try and take the lead and what we can do about it. Yeah, the, the last part, what to do about it, is, is a harder and probably a longer answer to give yeah. later. But I'll, I'll start you know, building off of what uh, Liza just talked yeah. about. You know, so I think it, first you think about what China is doing to support its own companies, to make them competitive. So they're using massive state subsidies in the, either the form of grants or loans. They have a protected market, one that's not easy to get into, so they can mature those companies. And then tech area... The name of the game is scale. You have to reach massive scale because you put so much R&D into either developing hardware or software. So China has a way of developing scale for its companies and then they can go global after they've had this incubation period where there's not competition coming from the West. Now when Western companies want to get into China, they face uh, requirements of doing forced technology transfers, often having to form joint ventures. Just to use one example in cloud computing it's not open to U.S. companies. They have to form joint ventures and cede their intellectual property to the Chinese. Yeah. On the other hand, we're wide open for Alibaba or for Tencent in the United States to do business on, on cloud computing. And then, as, uh, as I mentioned, there's this criminality. There is rampant intellectual property theft, m much of it supported by cyber means, but there's all kinds of uh, uh, policies that have been adopted to, to pursue intellectual property theft. So. You know, one of the ways to deal with this is through trade remedies, yeah. through the United States uh, pursuing these. That's been was part of, in part, part of the phase one deal uh, undertaken during the Trump administration. But it's a longer conversation. I think how we can address these yeah. challenges. Yeah. You know, Carl, one of the one of the claims that's been put out there about the ways that we might address uh, this challenge is to work more closely with our allies, work more closely with the Europeans. We've talked to the U.S. about sort of subsidizing U.S. industry at some level, providing the right kind of tax incentives and the like. Um, but we've also talked about working across the Atlantic, right? How is that effort looking? How is the work work with our allies going? Um, are they pursuing policies that are that are beneficial to to U.S. technology innovation or our combined U.S. European technology innovation, or, or are we facing challenges in that space as well? Well, we're facing huge challenges in that space. Uh, you know, there there's a double standard that's occurring right now. Um, you know, here domestically, uh, our regulators are focused on. Uh, how can we punitively attack, you know, our iconic American brands that lead globally? A lot of our position as a global innovation leader uh, is related to the fact that we build these iconic brands here at home, uh, and we grow them, and that they're the envy of the world, and they grow and provide services, you know, across the world. Um, you know, EU uh, and uh, growing UK regulation is aimed at uh, reducing. Uh, the competitive edge that America has with these leading global companies to advantage their own domestic and homegrown uh, companies. Uh, adding, you know, big taxes like in the DST regime uh, to just penalize American companies while isolating China thread companies like the ones you just mentioned uh, is, is a huge competitive problem for the U.S. Um, and, you know, the, the U.S. is a, an open uh, economy. It's committed to that. These, you know, you know sort of protectionism uh, items that are you know being put forward by the the EU government are only seeking to help uh, China and other economies grow and undermine our global leadership. Um, it, you know that's a really stark contrast to here at home, um, because if you listen to um, our Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo, she's very much against this when talking on the WTO and the world stage. But here at home, the DOJ, the FTC, and a lot of our regulatory regime is aimed at uh, you know curtailing large companies just for being large. Um, the consumer welfare standard, which has been the basis of our antitrust uh, you know, platform for 70 years, uh, is sort of being a, you know, set aside 
and instead new uh, regulations are being created that just target our American companies. So while abroad we're saying uh, these taxes are unfair, leave our companies alone, here at home we're saying yes, but you're big, so that must mean you're bad, and you know, we, we should break you in half, which only uh, seeks to help China gain a competitive edge against the U.S. Uh, and undermines our global leadership. Well, so, so let's talk a little bit more about that because, you know, there's obviously been a, a long-standing U.S. policy to uh, go after companies that, that, that use market power inappropriately, right, that if they're, if they're large and they're using that, that, that scale to prevent uh, market access for startups and competitors, right, that's one of our big innovation capabilities, the startups and competitors. Why isn't that what's going on here? Why, what, what, what is going on in the U.S. and, and in, the, in, in the EU that suggests that, that they're not going after companies because they're being they're using their market power inappropriately, but instead just because just because they're large. Well, I just want to start by saying that the DOJ and the FTC are not, you know, wounded soldiers who can't advance their ability to break companies up. Um, if you look at between 2000 and 2020, um, the U.S. government challenged approximately 780 mergers, and the merging parties won in court only 11 times. Um, let me tell you, when the DOJ comes after you to stop M&A activity, they win. Um, there is not some big new thing that is required in order to give them the power they need to regulate companies. Meanwhile, um, for most startups, acquisition is a really attractive and common exit opportunity. Last year, to demonstrate that, we had 1,164 venture-backed companies be acquired, while only 36 went public. And often these companies are facing going out of business or losing the technology they've built. Acquisition and M&A is a key way that they exit the market uh, there are only a very few that make it to IPO that, you know, achieve that true unicorn status. So when we prevent American companies from merging by creating new onerous guidelines that stops it from happening or the delay is too long and they're going to run out of capital before they exit, guess who's going to buy those companies? China and their related investors. We're opening up Greenfield for them to come in and buy our innovations and then make them theirs because we're just deciding that if you merge, you're bad. Okay, some mergers are not good. We all know that. I totally respect that. But the idea that a small company facing exit has got to be purchased by China or a China-backed entity instead of being bought by one of our iconic American brands is fundamentally wrong. So, Rob, what about that? I mean, does it make sense for us to continue to uh, to sort of support our industry um, and, and press the envelope forward? I mean, can we, can we win this on the backs of just pure competition alone, or do we need to adopt some of the approach that China has taken uh, to support our companies more directly? You know, there's been, you know, we had the bipartisan infrastructure law, we had, um, we had um, the, uh, the inflation, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, we had, um, we've had a lot of efforts by in the U.S., one, to protect our own, our own markets, but also to, you know, to put a lot of government financing into areas like critical minerals and the like. Is that the right approach? Do we need industrial policy to compete with China effectively? We might need that, but I'd say fundamentally, when American companies compete on a level playing field, they're likely to win. We have the best capital markets, we have the best talent pools because we pull from the entire world, and we have the best regulatory structure. So we have a lot of advantages when the level, the playing field is level. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier, with some of the forced technology transfer, closed markets in China. In addition, when you're doing business there, they have a number of regulations that are applied in very opaque ways. For example, they have something called the Personal Information Protection Law or the Cybersecurity Law that limit your ability to transfer data outside of China and uh, put major strictures on how companies can even operate with data inside the country. And now most recently there's something that's been enacted called the Counter Espionage Law, which they've used to go after several American companies and it makes it very hard for a company to do its own due diligence with suppliers and other partners in China. So it's becoming more difficult to do business there. So what we don't want to do is emulate China. We want to stick to what's really good for us. Now, I think there are areas, big successes in, I would say, the CHIPS Act and a few other areas where we've pursued fundamental research, basic research. Yeah. And then the private sector can turn that basic research into important applied research in a number of areas. That's been our model for success mm -hmm. in the United States, but the government historically, sub historically yeah. subsidizes some of that. And it's in the CHIPS Act, it's gone a little bit more into the applied area, um, and we're seeing how that's you know, playing out. But you know, as a relative amount of R&D in the U.S., the federal government is always going to supply just a tiny fraction of what the private sector is putting out there in the yeah. form of R&D. 
Eliza, when you were in the White House, one of the tools we used uh, quite effectively, uh, or, or you know, it, we used we used it, you know in a lot in, in a tough way uh, was export controls. Talk to us about the role that export controls play in this larger regime. Um, are they the right approach? Are strong export controls uh, the most effective way to get at it? There are a lot of concerns in U.S. industry that we're preventing U.S. industry from selling effectively and making money. Um, how does that trade-off work? How should we think about that trade-off of export controls, the impact it has on U.S. industry, but also the role it plays in starving uh, economies that are trying to trying to use that uh, capability uh, to build their own innovation the way you the way you described. Yeah, export controls are a really important tool, but they're just one tool in the toolkit. So um, I think we have to think about it holistically, and I think we also have to acknowledge that export controls only work when we have a technology choke point, when either just the United States or the United States and a small group of our allies, like Netherlands and Japan, has a technology choke point. And so once the technology has already diffused, globally, like EV batteries, export controls just aren't going to work. So I think they should be a narrowly targeted tool. Uh, they can be effective. Um, it's all about enforcement. And so um, agencies like BIS need to be resourced appropriately. There's a lot of pressure put on B BIS from the Hill and others to do their job, and that's good. But if they don't have the tools and the resources they need for enforcement, um, we can't even really say that we've tested whether export controls work if we're not really trying and equipping our agencies to actually monitor, track, and enforce these things. Um, so, but to tie it back to what Rob was saying about R&D and this yeah. holistic toolkit, um, you know, my team has proposed that the United States needs a techno-industrial strategy which would combine both, you know, running faster at home, promoting our own competitiveness through things like R&D and, and industrial strategy, as well as the protect side, export controls, research security and the like, as well as a third element of um, international trade, sort of moving towards demand alliances or pooling market demand to really make sure that eventually we will have a level playing field that kind of excludes China in certain sectors. But, um, you know, I think what Rob said about R&D is important, and it's true that the U.S. government plays a much smaller role than it used to during the Cold War um, and the Apollo program days in terms of the percentage of federally funded R&D compared to R&D across the ecosystem. But I think we need to be doing a whole lot more. It's actually a very good investment of, of taxpayer money to fund research and development. The CHIPS Act put $11 billion, as long as it's appropriated, to R&D in semiconductors. That's great, and we need to make sure that we're actually using it for risky, bold, long-term moonshot endeavors, not a kind of near-term, play-it-safe thing. Some of the money can go to that, but where the U.S. government really has a role is in buying down risks in these long-term priorities that are too risky for the private sector with, with its very near-term um, priorities yeah. to take on. So my, we're going to be, just to put in a plug for uh, our organization, we'll put out a report in about a week or two on microelectronics, trying to look like what's beyond the CHIPS Act and how does the U.S. stay ahead as Moore's law ends and, and things change to future paradigms of computing. And this is this is a strategic competitive studies project, right? That you work. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, and we all spit out a paper that's that's here um, on China that you all have a copy of on your on your on your uh, on your chair. So you take a look at that. Um, but I also also mentioned I want to talk about two of the things you raised. You raised R and D on one side. And you raised this point about international and sort of demand creation and demand pooling. Um, talk to us about that second piece, or the one you talked about first, uh, this idea of demand pooling. Tell us how that works, what's the concept, um, and then I want to get Rob and, and, and Carl's thoughts on that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so I think that under the last administration and the current one, as well as on the Hill, there's this emerging consensus on China's strategy that we need to be doing both promote and protect. So running faster at home, the chip sack, the IRA, investing in ourselves, yeah. developing talent. Everyone buys All motherhood and apple pie, right, exactly. great stuff. We need to be doing more of it. Right. Protect, export controls, you know, other things like that. Yeah. And what is missing, I believe, is a equally developed and coherent policy and legislative approach to what I call pooling market demand. So in, in, um, we need to be seeing the emergence of demand alliances, whether it's formal or informal trade alliances where we are basically trading and investing more with our allies and partners, more with democratic market economies, and less with China. 
this isn't the same as decoupling. I mean, I think it's fine to have some managed trade with our autocratic rivals as long as it's in our interests. Yeah, but, nobody cares we buy T-shirts from China, right. right? Like, what does it matter? Right, but in terms of uh, things where where you know it touches our critical infrastructure, yeah. emerging technologies, things like that, we really should be investing and trading more with other democratic market economies. And so this includes both kind of punitive measures like uh, import restrictions and things mm -hmm. like that, as well as trade deals, more kind of minilateral yeah. and plurilateral trade deals with other democratic market economies. And the point is to get to a place where a level playing field is happening. And that mm -hmm. simply isn't possible with China. Yeah. Um, they, we've tried that for the last 20 years. I think it was kind of a failure yeah. to incorporate China into this idea of a level playing field. Yeah. So Rob, you know, there's, uh, free trade has sort of gotten a bad name, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, in part because of the way it's been manipulated by, by some of the, uh, the players on, on the other side of the street. Um, but it sounds like what Liza is describing, Liza, tell me if I'm getting it wrong, is more sort of freer trade with our allies and partners in democratic nations. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So if that's right, I mean, how do you combat the sort of concerns about free trade? We're talking about expanding free trade with our allies. Is that, is that a doable thing from your perspective? Yeah, I think one of the most important things to talk to our allies about, and it's something we begun in the Trump administration at the time when I was at the State Department, was saying to countries that we know that China is going to come to you with something that's subsidized, super low cost, and not secure. There's yeah. huge security issues with using this kind of digital technology to Huawei, underpin ZTE. Yeah, your fundamental 5G future infrastructure. And so you need to start thinking about it less about what's the lowest cost and what's about the best value in the long run for you and your citizens. And that was the pitch that we made to these countries. And that's the case with our closest allies, and that was a case we had the to make UK, to them first. Yep. Right? And we you know, were successful in the end. And it's a case we need to make to the rest of the world, too. I mean, there's a small number of countries in the tight orbit around China, but there are others where you can appeal to their sense about what's the best value. And then, you know, because those uh, companies that are Chinese are being uh, uh, promoted by the government itself and then by their Chinese development bank as well as their Export-Import Bank to give them either zero interest loans to, to let them buy that technology or terms that say you don't have to start paying this back for five years. That is not in any way a reasonable uh, commercial term that any Western company could offer to them. Yeah. So we're not going to emulate them 100%, but things like our Development Finance Corporation or yeah. Export-Import Bank, the Europeans have a number of export credit agencies that can offer terms that are concessionary but still on a reasonable yeah. level. And so that's how we can be more competitive against the overall Belt and Road Initiative that China's pushing out there. Again, to help build a scalable market for this technology, we need to think differently when there's a company that's, that's being supported by a non-market economy. Yeah. Uh, you need to take different steps to address that. And I think trade agreements can be one of those things where we can start building up a broader base. Remember, for companies to move their supply chains around, they need talent, so they need yeah. workers. So we need to work with countries how to get the talent pools. We need basic infrastructure, ports, railways, roads, and then you need good regulatory practices. Yeah. And a lot of these trade agreements, especially digital trade, can get at the right kind of rules of the road about not requiring data localization, not requiring technology transfers. Those steps, the right regulatory framework will help crowd in investment from Western companies and help build to build together with these new yeah. markets. Yeah. And folks, by the way, we'll be taking questions from the audience, so so get ready here in a few minutes. We'll, we'll come to you for, for questions. Rob again? No, Is please, no, please sorry. jump in. I was actually going to go to Carl pile on, but please do it, do it, Liza. Yeah, jump in. <laughs> sorry, Carl, to jump the queue. No, I just have to say, because I don't think Rob wants to brag about his work, but um, you know, he and his team back in the last administration, when they were reaching out to countries about the need for trusted technology, they were really sticking their necks out. And there was a lot of skepticism from countries like, well, why does it matter? Can't I just buy the, the hardware st st yeah. stack from Huawei and then manage it myself? You know, I'll set up, you know, use my own security protocols and right. all that. Um, so it was really, it seemed like quite a stretch, I think. And Rob just had to keep going out there and kind of pounding the pavement. And I think, uh, the importance of that has only been borne out as the technology has evolved. And now that we're living in a 5G world, headed quickly towards a 6G world, where everything in our lives is being embedded by these sensors, by these chips, where data is going all over the place. Um, and also when you take on the hardware, you're also taking on the service contracts from the Huawei's and the Nuketech's and the Alibaba's of the world, that continual access. And so the importance of trusted technology operating, you know, operated by companies 
uh, that are operating in a rule of law environment has only been borne out. And it's only going to get more important as everything becomes embedded with AI and connected to the grid and, and data is being sent back. And so the importance of trust in technology, I think, has been borne out yeah. um, by, by uh, the way the tech is going. Yeah, and we should talk about trust, safety, and security in AI with the new executive order and the Bletchley Declaration yesterday. Uh, but Carl, I do want to talk to you about uh, you know this concept of, that Liza and Rob were talking about of, um, of freeing up trade with some of our allies, right? Um, it seems like, and I don't mean to make you the, the beat up on the EU guy, but I will, um, it seems like some of our allies are going the other direction, right? And Rob mentioned it briefly, data localization laws and the like. Um, uh, punitive measures um, on on companies that aren't theirs, um, or the, the the use of their of what appear to be even-handed laws, but but the application of them in, in differential ways. How are we going to get to better free trade with our allies and expand trade with them if they're not willing to play the same game with us? Well, let me uh, just sidestep your question and say what I want to say first, and then I'll come back to it. <laughs> well, at least you admit it. That's a standard DC technique, right? But Carl's going to be like, let me show what I'm going to do, and then we'll come back to it. Um, you know, just domestically, I want to uh, want to pile on by uh, reading what our FBI Director Christopher Wray testified two weeks ago. There's no country that presents a broader, more comprehensive threat to our ideas, our innovation, and our economic security, and ultimately our national security, referring to China. We've seen efforts by Chinese government, directly or indirectly, trying to steal intellectual property, trade secrets, personal data all across the country. We're talking everything from Fortune 100 companies to smaller startups. And he goes on and on and on. Um, the threat from China is not hyperbole, and some of our international partners really want, need to focus on that. Um, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in March released a study that said that China has taken the lead globally over the U.S. in 37 out of 44 technologies, and it's making huge investments to make that possible. Uh, this is why it's really important here domestically that we need to fully fund the CHIPS Act, uh, and we have got to get our house in order on STEM education and, and, and visas for foreign workers. Um, there's a study that's about to come out that's going to say it, but we all know it, China is exploiting the fact that we cannot get our immigration house in order to get um, STEM graduate workers in here to do the jobs that we need, and they are attracting them to China, and they have incredibly robust programs to do that. They're also graduating like 2x of our PhD in STEM graduates. Um, they are laying all the foundation they need uh, to you know, take over in, as being the global innovation leader. You know, as we think about things like AI, um, and, and you know the rise of data, um, an ethical-based, you know, responsible innovation platform to globally lead the world is where we have got to be. And our allies, to your point, Jamil, um, either need to get on board or get off board that China is not, you know, a, a normal player. That they're obviously not following the you know, same rules that the WTO. They want to overtake us. That is their goal. And we need to maintain our global innovation leadership so that we can responsibly innovate for you know, all of the globe. Uh, and the U.S. is the only one who can lead that. Uh, and the, the EU all, you know, will, will uh, attempt to do it, but they you know, sort of look like they you know, ready, fire, aim when it comes to creating regulation. They do a rush to regulation, and then they try to figure it out. So it, here at the U.S., we need to get the policy right, um, which is why we are heartened that when we're thinking about AI, you know, Leader Schumer is actually doing a great job bringing together a lot of um, stakeholders to say, what should we do? What should AI policy be? We're being thoughtful about it before we just rush to regulate. But let me tell you, the states are about to all come back in session, and they're going to all want to do something on AI. Yeah. So what is the U.S. doing to let our, lay our markers down now with our allies saying, don't rush to regulate, you're only hurting yourself, um, you're only you know, hurting our standing versus China, and raising this threat that while we're all trying to play on a, you know, an even playing field, as you mentioned, they're not. They are just trying to beat us, and they're doing a very effective job at it. Uh, now, do you want to yeah. probe in for more? Or? Well, well, you, 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 like Liza, raised two issues that I want to talk about. One is this AI point, and I want to come back to that, but I want to talk about immigration for a second, because you know we're here on Capitol Hill. Immigration is the hot-button issue of the day, border security, the like. Um, it's being tied into everything. Um, your position on, 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 on immigration sounds like we need more, uh, particularly the STEM area, we need more help from abroad, right? Um, and this is not without controversy, right? There are a lot of people who fear uh, that opening up more visas uh, to foreigners from abroad will uh, take jobs from Americans. 
Why is that not going to happen, at least in the near term? Why, why do we need STEM talent from abroad in the near term? And how will that affect the sort of the U.S. economic base and our technology innovation capabilities? Um, what are we doing today that's, that's wrong and what do we need to change? Well, uh, to start with, um, if left, left unaddressed, the um, talent shortage of workers with a post-secondary degree will, will result in more than 9 million job vacancies and a $1.2 trillion lost in production over the next decade. In the U.S.? In the U.S. Uh, well, why can't we just grow that talent like without, why can't we just grow it at home? Because we don't have the people, and we don't have them in STEM in a STEM pipeline. And if we maximize the STEM pipeline, we'd still have the gap. So as we work on increasing our uh, you know STEM aptitude at home, we have to have the workers to fill the jobs for all the uh, chip plants and other you know you know. So we're not taking American jobs if you open up more visa pipelines. I want to be really clear about this because this is this is the debate up here, right? Are we taking American jobs away? And the answer is. The answer is no, and uh, TechNet did a study with Harvard that showed district by district the STEM gap, and we can tell any member of Congress uh, what their district is graduating in terms of STEM graduates and the jobs that are available in their own district. The gap is only widening, and it's massive. And we need we, to address that problem as well, right? The pipeline itself. The pipeline has got to be fixed, but you know, in the we're not getting there in the near term. In the interim, China is uh, producing all these STEM graduates. Um, 77,000 this year, and they're keeping them all there to work. We're producing ours. They all go into to, uh, the, the very open uh, and, and lucrative job field, but then there's still this huge gap, Jimmy. Yeah. So to, to fill the gap, the, the, the gap, we need you know, better H-1B and STEM visa programs. And one great way to do that would be when students come here to learn and get STEM uh, you know, education from our institutions, we should staple a green card to their diploma as they graduate to encourage them to stay here and work and fill these jobs. And build their companies here. Instead of going home to another country where they will go up and build them. We're training them with our ideals and values and our education system and then they're going home where they are and they're using that to grow a company when they could do it here. So Rob, talk to us about um, this challenge that we face. So, you know, politically, right, it's, it's pretty difficult to argue for more visas more immigration in the current climate, right? Um, how should we think about that when it comes to AI and the advancement we're making? Obviously, the U.S. has done really well on AI. We're leading, we're out there first in the world, but other countries, China included, are seeking to catch up rapidly. Is there gonna be a gap for AI capability as well if we don't address the STEM talent issue? Absolutely, <clears throat> and I, I would say, you know, one, one way to think about this, and you know, we've all seen the movie Oppenheimer, is we saw those German scientists coming to America, but what they worked with, they worked with Americans. So I think part of what Carl was saying is that when you, when you bring in the best talent of the world, some of those are already Americans, some are foreign nationals, but then you build a bigger ecosystem around the R&D and the applied side of the technology of the future. Yeah. We want to be the hub where everybody wants to be to produce the best tech, and to answer your question about AI, AI is now the kind of the latest and greatest. I'm sure Quantum will be soon after this, but you know AI will fundamentally change every sector of the economy. So you really need the best um, researchers, engineers involved in these processes. So um, it's a combination of, you know, as we we're talking about, like fixing our immigration system and as well as building the the STEM talent pipelines domestically. Yeah. You know, one of the things we don't often talk about is that, you know, everywhere else in the world, you go somewhere, it's very hard to move to Germany and become a German, right? Mm -hmm. It's not impossible. It's very hard to move to China and become Chinese. Tons of the world moves to America and becomes American. They buy into the American dream, right? We give them this education, they build companies here, and, and, and that talent doesn't go abroad, right? But we have to create the system that allows that to happen. We're not doing that today. Liza, talk to us about how, how this all ties into the concept that you raised earlier of, of creating those alliances right abroad, right? You talked about that, that, that commonality we have with free and democratic societies uh, around the globe. Um, how does the talent pipeline relate to that, to that issue? Uh, so if I just want to, yeah, I want to share a statistic. So 65% of the founders or co-founders of our best AI companies are immigrants. So let that sink in. We would not be leading the world right now in generative AI if it were not for immigrants. So 
Yes, we need to develop STEM talent. Yes, we need workforce training, but that takes a long time. We need to be firing on all cylinders. The only way to get ready AI talent that's ready right now that we can plug into the workforce is to clean up and clear up our Im high skilled immigration system. Um, I have an 11 year old. I would love it if I could send him to an AI camp next summer and he can be ready for that career in 10 or 20 years, but that's not fast enough. The technology is moving too fast, so we need to, to meet these gaps. These are huge, yawning workforce gaps, and we need to meet them with immigrants as well as homegrown talent. So, um, and it needs to be done with common sense guardrails. Uh, I, you know, screen out the yeah. uh, folks who have ties back to MilSiv fusion or things like that. I think we need more common sense guardrails. Um, yeah, don't do it stupidly. Right, 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 exactly. But um, I've worked on China policy for most of my career, and then coming over to SCSP and focused on technology and the tech competition, I am convicted that the number one thing the United States needs to do to get right, to win the tech, co tech competition with China, is the people, the talent, immigration. That is the number one thing. If we do that, we will have the talent to do all the other things that we know we need to do. Um, so I, I think the EO that the administration put out uh, sort of gets to that a bit. It, it does what the executive branch can do, which is you know, relatively limited in terms of clearing up a visa backlogs yeah. and things of that nature. But I think the onus is really on yeah. Congress to fix yeah. it. So we're going to turn to the audience for questions. I just have one, one last set of questions on AI, and then we can turn to the audience. So uh, you mentioned the EO. Um, a lot of people, I think, were surprised uh, by the, the strident nature of the regulatory impact that the, that the EO is likely to have, particularly in the, in, the, in the initial parts, where it talks about a significant amount of reporting coming from AI companies, um, uh, people who have tech compute capabilities, uh, in requirements on cloud providers to, to know their customers uh, and the like, uh, their foreign customers. Talk to us about uh, the the EO and your view on on its impact, uh, its regulatory sca uh, scope, uh, whether we're going down the right road. Um, there are, I think, I think everyone agrees we need a lot more trust, safety, and security in AI, and that maybe the government has a role to play. Is the EO heading the right direction? Do you want me to start? Or yeah, Liza. Well, okay, uh, well, well, sure. Carl, you want to jump in first, or Liza? You, which, who well, wants to? Uh, sure, I'll be brief, but. All right. uh, you know, AI isn't new. Uh, you know, we've all been using AI to get where we want to go and, uh, you know, predict severe, severe weather and uh, it's been used in the healthcare field for years. If you've been, you know, Googling a restaurant and it completes it for you, like you've been using AI. The idea that uh, it is now, you know, more prevalent in our discourse comes out of, you know, chat GPT being launched and everyone being fascinated with these conversations with generative AI chatbots. But AI is so much more than that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm pleased to see the administration and, and others put forward proposals that uh, look to uh, put appropriate safeguards around AI, uh, which they should have and the public, you know, is, you know, when polled, agrees we should have safeguards. But we should not have a rush to regulate because we're uncertain about generative AI. We've all seen the Terminator movies and, um, you know, other related things that have scary implications. because. Uh, other countries like China aren't going to pause to check and see um, if they have you know, good moral standing in order to move forward with um, completing AI investments that will only seek to undermine the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has got to remain at the, at the forefront of AI development. Our companies are leading the way in that. Um, our companies are seven out of the top ten investors in AI. Um, and if we are putting too much regulation on it and not allowing the uh, ecosystem to flourish, we're only helping um, China and other countries beat us and put their moral code into the foundational technology that will lead the next 50, 100 years. Um, so I want to take one step further from that, which is you never get a second chance at a you know, bad first impression. ChatGPT and some kind of you know, weird conversations that reporters had with them and kind of a fear tactic that the media has been using has scared everybody about AI. Um, and there's a lot of good that will come from AI, including curing disease, helping you know, doctors predict cancer faster. Um, it certainly was related to recent vaccine development. Um, it can predict severe weather to get people out of harm's way, which is why our organization, TechNet, it has started a $25 million campaign to educate uh, consumers on the positive benefits of AI and how they're going to directly impact their life 
the risks are being well covered in the ecosystem. But how ha has this, you know, relate to a voter has not been addressed. So I think that we all need to, you know, be, have a little bit more balanced conversation as we're thinking about regulation. Yes, we need to provide safeguards to reduce bias and make sure that we don't all end up in a terminator scenario. But if we can cure disease or help your kids learning disability or um, you know, predict severe weather and uh, increase crop yields, why wouldn't we do that because of just fear? Yeah, so uh, I think there's a lot. Uh, it's great that the administration came out and is taking a run at global leadership and AI governance. And the, the EU thought they were going to beat us to the punch. But, like they, uh, we got like they have front, on privacy so, in other places. Yep. Um, and, and China as well put out their global governance framework. So I think it's really good that the U.S. is in the game. There's uh, three fundamental building blocks for national power in AI, and I think the EO alludes to each of them, but there's a lot more work to do by Congress and others if that's really going to be manifest across the ecosystem. So compute, data, and governance. Compute, of course, is the computing power, the cloud computing, and the big AI chip clusters that you need to make these breakthroughs. And the EO uh, does things like pilot the National AI Research Resource. This is a really great idea, it needs to be funded, um, that would make large compute resources available for the little guys make sure it's not just the you know the big tech firms that are the only ones that can afford this stuff um, on data you know it talks a lot about privacy and kind of balancing risks uh, risk to privacy cybersecurity risks with opportunity again um, I think there's a need for national privacy legislation there's only so much the executive branch can do there um, I know Carl has given a lot of thought to what that should look like and then people, I think, you know, people is the most important component of AI leadership, and we've talked about that yeah, a lot so absolutely. far today. Rob, any last thoughts I think, on AI? Yeah, if I, if I yeah, may. Please. Um, I, I agree with these uh, innovation points, and, you know, covering Im uh, immigration as well as this that NI, National AI Research Resource, which will help make sure that compute power is available to new model developers. I think my fundamental critique with the executive order is that it doesn't include enough of the views of Congress or the views of the private sector. This was largely done in a black box, which has always been the criticism of AI, um, that you know, Congress, through the Schumer process and here on the House, the committees and, and leadership are trying to get their hands around AI in a very thoughtful uh, manner and, and building up, I think, to come up with the regulatory framework. This sort of leaps ahead in doing some regulation in some places. I'm not totally against what's here, but there is a gap between the aspirations that are laid out and what, how individual, say, developing guardrails and best practices, which is kind of a theme throughout, what will those mean in different types of applications in the area of healthcare, autonomous vehicles, or in, in financial services? The risks are very different. There's very different levels. So, you know, if one rushes out there and doesn't have tight standards for even defining metrics to, to then draw baselines of risk, and then how to buy down that risk, then you're like, you could end up with a regime that's too heavy-handed, overly prescriptive, restrains U.S. innovation, doesn't let us compete as well as we should with the Chinese and other, others in the world. So I think it can be uh, applied in ways that are less heavy-handed. And more back to the model that we thought was great at NIST of developing an AI risk management framework where you look at the risks related to how you're going to use AI in your individual context. Yeah. Then you, you map those out, those risks, and then you measure where you are relative to where you want to be in each of those risk areas, and then you have a governance process to address those. And you do that over time. So, you know, we know there's risks related to cybersecurity, to privacy, to robustness, to safety in different ways. But those terms are just kind of thrown out there without having standards that can be applied to them. And that's fundamentally the problem with the EU AI Act, because they don't have standards yet. There is development of international, global international standards by the private sector, but those are in, still in early stages in some ways, other than yeah. having a general risk management framework. But we need to have specific standards in each of those uh, areas of risk in order to develop a whole regime that's not going to be just a check the box right. paperwork exercise, which I know and others that know from cybersecurity area is not is something we sought to avoid right. for decades. Right. Not just having a check the box where I'm just complying and sending paperwork in the government, but I'm actually trying to buy down the risk to protect my business partners that are using it and the consumers are also yeah. on the back end of the or on the other side of the the deployment of AI. So I think 
you know, the jury's still out on, on that and yeah, the EO. Got it. That makes sense. All right. Well, folks, it's now time for questions from the audience. Uh, who has a question? Yeah, please. Ma'am. Uh, yes, coming back to the topic of China, I would like to know whether actually the sanctions work. The reason I'm asking that is because, according to the Biden administration, it's supposed that companies cannot sell advanced chips as well as advanced technologies to China. But you know, there's always ways to get around that to other countries. So those really, is this really working? It's a great question. Um, enforcement is key. So I think the recent tightening of the regulations that came out on October 17th attempt to address some of those loopholes and workarounds by, um, you know, including subsidiaries and then including these other, you know, 41 countries that we have kind of proliferation concerns, so increasing the restrictions. So they're really dialing up and broadening the restrictions to try to address that. Um, so I think that is good. But for these to work, I mean, these look great on paper. For these to work, you have to have enforcement officers at BIS. You have to have people who understand China, understand Chinese. And guess what? There's lots of great AI software that can help with that, that can gather the open source information, process it very effectively. I wish I had that when I was doing this kind of work five or 10 years ago. It didn't exist. So there's great open source tools out there to help, but um, commerce and, and other agencies that actually monitor and enforce these controls need to be given those tools and, and resourced appropriately. So the bottom line is not working good yet. I think they're, yeah, I think they need to be constantly updated and, um, you know, it's great to put pressure on the enforcement agencies, but they need the tools to do the job. Additional questions? Yeah, right here, please. Hi, I'm Kelsey Frierson. I'm a technology fellow with Senator Thune focused on AI and cyber, so really appreciate this conversation today. Um, I have a couple of questions, but the first one, um, how do you view open source AI models in this broader conversation? I know that Alibaba released an open source model in August. Um, what is China's move in open sourcing some of these? And how do open source models in the US impact kind of this like US China tech competition? And you know, the, the EO also mentions open source and asks for a report on, on the threats that open source might pose because the model weights being public and the like. What do we think about open source? Uh, AI capability. I think it's really important, and as Jamil pointed out, the AI uh, or the EO touches on this, but it doesn't have any answers. It, right. I think it tasks a report. It has, so tasks a report, exactly. It's kind of kicking the can down the road, and so I think we're really going to need the best um, minds in engineering, people who really understand this, to advise the government. Um, industry really needs to be collaborative and kind of helping the, the government create guardrails that actually make sense because the technology is going fast. Um, I think what you've seen in China is a growing attention to risk five and open source architectures. This used to be an industry-led thing, but I think as U.S. restrictions have increased, the PRC government has put more priority on seeing risk five as a possible alternative and long-term workaround. So that's definitely concerning. Tell us, um, tell us what that is, risk five. Uh, it's an open source architecture for semiconductor design. Um, so there's a lot of good opportunities there. You know, open source maybe gives more um, visibility, but it also creates new risk vectors. Um, Rob, you want to jump I, in? I would just say, yeah. you know, Fundamentally, open source is critical in a number of different er areas, including yeah. you know, open source designer semiconductors with this RISC V. Open source is Im important in this, the software area. You know, so we have Linux, we, which is the kernel for mm -hmm. you know, compute. Um, so it's going to be important in AI as well. And the concern that's been raised is that if, if you're seeking to control these very advanced frontier models, maybe you don't want that open sourced. But open source is going to be really important for small businesses, for you know, just a few folks getting together and starting a new company. Mm -hmm. They will want to be able to op have an open source opportunity to create modules that they can put together. There's this website called Hugging Face. You know, it's a startup company where you can go yourself on there and, and try to pull together your own models and you can pull in data sets, yeah. you can run things. So it's going to be inevitable we have that. I also think fundamentally AI will move the direction of 
using less data, needing less compute power, so that will empower more people out there to have access to, to data sets. So we can't really control them in just the hands of a small number of companies. And the price of compute power is going to go down exponentially. So it's almost like an area of cybersecurity where we know exploits exist and we go after the bad actors. We know these, these, so these pieces of software out there. Now, AI is, a, I would say, a software for good, not for bad in the exploit sense. But it's a, it, that software will proliferate across borders, so it doesn't make sense for us to try just to lock down all of it. Now, there might be, again, certain models that we might want to have restrictions around. But generally speaking, open source is a very good thing for tech, and, and we need to preserve it also in the area of artificial intelligence. So, so Rob, I want to make sure I hear what you're saying. Are you saying, so there's, there's room for both, sort of yeah. proprietary models, chat GPT, Dolly, whatever, and, and sort of the open source stuff that, that Meta's doing, Llamas and the like, is that, is that what you're saying yeah. essentially? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it, you know, we, we a lot of times think about those general purpose AI models uh, that, that are large language models that were, you know, had 1.75 billion parameters right. in the model and, you know, massive compute power that only a few can afford to do. Yeah. But as we look at domain specific AI for like specific purposes, those will be trained in much smaller data sets yeah. and use much less compute power. And so that could be proprietary or open source, but again, if uh, you know, you're creating a new company that's doing autonomous vehicles, you may not want to spend all your time on the AI part of it. You want to spend your time on the engineering to get the, the product out there. So there's going to be a lot of folks who want to just use simple open source models. Awesome. And Kelsey, I know you have additional questions. Let me see if there's anybody else and then we'll come back to you. Anybody else questions? I have nothing to add. Yes, please, the back. Sorry. Perfect. Oh, did he? Oh. Um, I guess for Rob or the rest of you, what do you think? Do you feel like um, we should wait uh, until we have more mature guidelines for um, ethical, responsible use of AI, or do you believe that we, you know, times of the essence and we need quicker? You know? I, th I think we can set some high-level vision of where we want to go, but I think we need to be cognizant of what companies should be required to do today. Like, you can do risk management today in high-risk areas without having all those standards. But when you're talking about paper, paperwork exercise, compliance checks, outside ex experts being involved in somehow reviewing impact assessments, those need to be checked against something that's objectively valid, that they're, they're, they're checking it. The area where they're, uh, in addition to the ones you mentioned, that's been very, I think, productive is the International Standards Organization has a joint technical committee with the uh, International Electro Technical Commission so never put those six words together. You never get that <laughs> it's a lot going so on. I separate them. A lot going on. But they have a committee 42, which is just on AI. They have a risk management standard, and now they're developing something called an AI management system that will be able to be gone. You can take that to a third party and be certified that your AI system meets that. Now that again, that encapsulates a risk management approach, and it doesn't necessarily have vignettes on each of those specific risk areas, but that will mature as well. So I, I would just, just want to point out that ISO has got a, made a lot of progress in this area too. Uh, but I, I'm sure that no policymaker just wants to wait and say, I don't want, I'm willing to wait till all these standards are done. You, you might want to put some Yeah, so go now, don't wait for, yeah. don't wait for everybody to get their, all, their, all their things just done. Be, but as they design whatever compliance process, it's got to be cognizant that there aren't standards yet yeah. in the number of areas. So can I just add one quick point, Probably. which is, uh, not specific to your question, but more broadly speaking, it's not like AI is a completely unregulated domain where you know everyone is running rampant. Um, there's extremely comprehensive sectoral um, regulation covering every aspect of AI today. In as applied in a given sector, and and every agency has the tools already to uh, ensure compliance. So I'm concerned that a lot of the, these efforts are giving the impression to a consumer or voter that this is unregulated, you know, the wild, wild west. And there's a lot of fear going on around this, right? I mean, AI has the, has the possibility to raise all boats in significant ways, right? I mean, this, this can be transformative for the U.S. economy. It can be very transformative, and, and it will be transformative. It will change the way we work. Um, it will change the way we live. It will improve standards of quality of, of life, you know, across the sectors. And in ways we don't know, that's why it's innovation, right? It's the unknown that we're really solving for. We do need appropriate safeguards, right? We want to protect against bias, against you know national security implications, against uh, things that that could harm us. Uh, but this is you know the, the next major revolution. 
yeah. uh, that will change the, fundamentally how it, you know, everything that we do goes. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate every standards body that's looking at this, but I want to just ring the bell that like I think that if you would ask Lena Khan, do you have regulatory authority to act with respect to AI at big companies, she thinks she does. Might not want her to. <laughs> and I think yeah, if you read her recent statement, she's ready to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So very interesting discussion, uh, both on export controls, but I have a, a foundational question. There's a lot of discussion about AI, and there was in the EO, but nobody seems to be talking about the data integrity upon which AI is based. Because all these transformative innovations you're talking about can really be deleterious if the data doesn't have integrity. So it's fascinating to me that that root element, at least, and I may have missed it, it was a 63-page executive order. 111. 111. 400 yeah. pages of yeah. export regulations, no definitions, et cetera. But have you given some thought on how to address, I'm not going to say manage, govern, control, how do you address that crucial basic issue of data integrity? Well, Liza, you flagged this yeah. as one of your three That's core right. areas, right around. Data, but yeah. the data integrity, I'm going to yeah. refer to yeah. Robert yeah. Carl. I just say, when that. we talk about risk management, we, we, we also, you know, I, I failed to say it today, but you know, we're talking about the entire life cycle. And so that's the buzzword in the field. So the life cycle includes the data that you're going to acquire, the data integrity of that, that you're, you're trading models on. So for sure, it's, it's got to be part of the, the overall risk analysis. And, and as I said, w when you do risk, a risk management process, you know, identifying risk, risk, there's risk in the data that you're, you're pulling together, that you're training it on. And then there's also later, you know, when you're deploying it, you're also pulling it, pulling it against certain data sets. So you know you got to be cognizant of data in both areas. Yeah, I mean, and I want to give a practical example. So, so I'm an attorney, and of course we're prohibited from using Chat GPT. But that doesn't mean you don't want to dabble. So I yeah. ran a Chat GPT. I asked them a question about CFIUS and export yeah. controls. They wrote 20 pages for me, a quarter of which was wrong, mm -hmm. incorrect yeah. citations, yeah. cases yeah. that were misconstrued. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there's a combination of data integrity because a portion of it was correct. I mean, they drew, obviously, from. So I don't know what I don't know. If I'm not schooled in the area and I ask for it, I don't know how I would make my risk assessment in that regard because well, yeah. I have no frame of reference. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great point. Look, I mean, I think, I think um, we're, we're training students on how to, how to think about these issues all, all the time, right? I think one of the things you're hearing, though, is you know, if we just stick our heads in the sand and pretend like it's not going to happen, right? And yeah, just like, for example, you just said you're barred from using it. Yeah. To me, that's crazy, right? Well, you bar people from using it, then they're not going to learn how to use it effectively, right? right. You want to train them on how to use it in, a, in the right way, learn how to identify hallucinations, right? And then address those, not just be like, well, we're just going to pretend like it's not there and, you know, no, we're not going to play. And, and the example of lawyers is probably a little unique because, you know, judicial systems, the courts don't, you know, they can bar, just bar you. There's all kinds of other actors, yeah. and that may not be the best example, but I just wanted to give it because yeah. it's not going to be anybody's life per se. Although if I'm writing a brief for a pro bono defendant who's on death row and I give a crappy brief, that's pretty impactful yeah. from that perspective. So, yeah. And I'm not point, yeah. suggesting, Jamil, that it not be yeah. used. I'm just saying as we look at the problem, sometimes it seems we don't go back to the root because it's just so much regulation. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, so much. So I, I know that we're almost at time. Um, I do want to give Kelsey one more chance to ask any, any last questions you have, and then we'll wrap up. So Kelsey. Okay, super quick. Um, yeah, just, please. Um, Lisa, you talked a lot about export, co export controls as one tool in the toolbox. Um, I'd love your thoughts on outbound investment restrictions. Mm. I know there's a big move in House and Senate right now on digital restrictions in there. <coughs> How effective is that in some of this like, U.S.-China tech competition, especially with a lot of companies that are continuing to invest in multinational startup AI companies? Yeah, I think Congress has a role here, you know, as a former overworked federal government bureaucrat, I can say that when the administration does an EO and tasks the Treasury Department and others to do something as they've just done, Treasury has to do that based on their existing personnel and resources. So I think there's a role for Congress in shaping it and then providing the resources. Again, there's some great open source AI tools that these people should be able to use. Um, but they're not going to go out and, and get it with their existing budget. So 
Um, I think it needs to be done right. I think Congress can push the administration to go further in some areas, to go broader in some areas. Um, I think the administration um, explicitly took a, an extremely narrow approach, and I think there's definitely a role for an iterative process with, with Congress to make sure that evolves as the tech challenge evolves. Awesome. Rob Carley, you want to weigh in on outbound? Uh, I can. It's hard. It's hard to do better than Liza on, the, on, the, on her explanations of this. I, I would say um, it, it's really important that we keep in mind uh, what the global competitive landscape is. So if you if you stop U.S. investors, where does that money flow to potentially? So again, the need to have a multilateral approach uh, to to these 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 uh, restrictions, and they really need to be focused on an outcome. So we trying to stop them from using it in their military, then think tightly about where there are companies developing it for military yeah. use. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks to Liza, Rob, and Carl for being here. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Thanks Neil. Thank you. This is awesome. Thank you for doing great. This. Um, hey, let's oh, grab a picture with the banner before we okay. leave. Okay.